Hello everyone uh, and welcome to lecture 29 in our course on general psychology. Uh, and in this unit what we're going to do uh, is refer back to the previous unit on psychological disorders. Uh, and in this unit we're going to talk about how psychological disorders are treated, how we try to eliminate them, or how we try to at least uh, alleviate symptoms. Uh, and so we're going to refer back to last unit's content. Uh, and we're going to talk about two broad categories. Uh, one is psychotherapy, which will be the topic for this unit. Uh, and then the other is, is biological means uh, of alleviating psychological disorders. And that will be next lecture. Uh, also, this unit is the last unit in our course. Uh, so lectures 29 and 30 will be the last lectures, the last new content we have. Uh, so bear that in mind as well. There will be no future lectures uh, in this course. So what we're going to do today uh, is, is learn about treatments, and, and in particular, psychotherapeutic treatments, that is, those treatments uh, that depend on psychotherapy. Uh, and psychotherapy, as we'll see, uh, is an interaction with a licensed or credentialed uh, clinician of some sort. Uh, so it's largely talk-based. There's, depending on the therapy you're talking about, there can be an emphasis on behavior. Uh, but a lot of this is about interaction with the therapist. Uh, we'll talk about different methods. So there's not just one method of psychotherapy. There are many methods. Uh, and we'll go over some of the most famous and the most popular ones uh, and talk about a little bit about historical trends. Uh, which ones were, were common, how common are they now, uh, how common were they historically. So we're going to feel for some of the most common uh, or historically relevant methods. Uh, and we'll also, as we cover this topic, see that there are differences between these various approaches. Uh, so they're different in terms of what they think psychological disorders come from, so the, the cause of psychological disorders, uh, and they certainly differ uh, in terms of the methods they use. So how do they try to treat psychological disorders? And we'll see that a lot of that perspective on treatment uh, comes out of what the cause is perceived to be. So what we're going to do today uh, is first we'll talk about mental health services kind of in general, and we'll see why lots of people have psychological disorders, uh, and yet they don't seek out mental health services. They don't seek out treatment. Uh, and we'll talk about why that is at the beginning of the day. Uh, we'll also see these different approaches have their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, so we'll cover a variety of them. And again, some are more popular now than they were before. Some are less popular now uh, than they were before. Uh, and, and so there's a, often a reason for that in terms of how effective they are or what the pros and cons are. Uh, again, we'll see that these different approaches uh, use different methods. There are different ways of treating disorders. Uh, even within the realm of psychotherapy. Uh, so we'll see what those methods are, what sort of methods a psychotherapist might use uh, if they subscribe to a particular school of thought. Uh, and again, we'll see that the theories behind psychological disorders that come from these different approaches uh, inform the approach to treatment. Uh, so depending on which psychotherapeutic approach you're in, you're using, uh, you have a different idea of, of what's causing them or the best way to go about treating the disorder. So talking about disorders in general, we've already covered them uh, in our previous unit, but just to sort of remind you, uh, psychological disorders are surprisingly common. In the United States, uh, a person has about a 46% chance of having a psychological disorder over the course of their lifetime. Uh, and this diagram here on the right is, is not from your book, uh, but it, it's a pie chart that indicates how common psychological disorders are. So things like anxiety disorders, mood disorders, which we talked about in our last unit, uh, attention deficit disorders, uh, schizophrenia, uh, these are all very common. Uh, also substance abuse, which we're not really going to talk about uh, in this unit. Uh, we, we talked about it in our unit on psychoactive drugs. Uh, but all of them put together, we're talking about tens of millions of people, and that's just in the U.S. Uh, so it, it's a big problem. Uh, there are social costs. So people themselves that suffer from them suffer social consequences. Uh, they have difficulty interacting with others. They certainly have a 
psychological cost that they pay, uh, and also the people around them. Uh, even if they're not, strictly speaking, the caretaker for the individual, if the disorder is severe, um, the impact on society is still quite large in terms of uh, emotional and social costs. Uh, there are literal economic costs as well, uh, in terms of lost productivity, depression. Uh, it takes a huge cost on our production value. Uh, and, and also, of course, there are the literal costs of treatment. Uh, so, we're again talking about billions of dollars, uh, not just in what we lose by virtue of someone uh, not being able to function as effectively, uh, but also what it costs to treat that person. Uh, so, so, these are big numbers. And, and what's surprising uh, is that despite this huge toll that mental disorders take, uh, not that many people seek out treatment for a mental disorder. We're about to talk about why that is. Uh, but only about 18% seek treatment within a year. And of course that 46% figure uh, is over the person's lifetime. Uh, but a lot of the 46%, those are not momentary disorders. They're not even disorders that last only a year. Uh, they can be chronic. Uh, and so it's surprising that only 18% of individuals will seek treatment. And, and a lot of those are for obvious and severe psychological disorders. The question is, why don't more people seek treatment when they have psychological disorders? Uh, well, one is, is lack of awareness. So people may not think that they have a psychological disorder. They may not be aware of the problem. Uh, and so obviously, if they don't know that they have a psychological disorder, they're less likely to seek out mental health services. Uh, there can also be a lack of, of belief in the importance of treatment. And what I mean by that is, uh, treatment may not be important to someone if for example, uh, they don't think the disorder is severe enough, so they don't seek out treatment. Uh, so maybe they're aware of having a problem, but don't think it's severe enough to, to merit treatment. Or maybe they think they should handle it on their own, that they should be self-sufficient. Uh, also, uh, people often don't seek out treatment because they don't think treatment will work, so that there's a lack of belief in the effectiveness of treatment. So that's why treatment might not be important to someone. Uh, or maybe treatment isn't important enough to overcome the stigma of mental illness. So we talked about this some in our previous unit as well, uh, that mental illness and mental health services that accompany that illness uh, are fairly stigmatized. Uh, people don't want to be perceived as needing psychological help. They certainly don't want to be perceived as having a psychological disorder. Uh, and, and so that can be a deterrent to seeking treatment. Uh, there are also more literal physical barriers to treatment. Uh, one is the treatment may not be available, especially to those that live in more rural areas. Uh, there may not be a treatment center around. Uh, or there may be one around, but it's too expensive. Treatment can be very costly in an economic sense. Uh, and so people may, may not be able to afford treatment. Uh, and of course, treatment could be nearby or at least within a reasonable distance, but a person could have transportation issues. Uh, and so there are a number of reasons why people don't end up seeking treatment. Uh, but for those that do seek treatment, uh, there is, are a couple of big categories of approach, and, and in this lecture we'll talk about one of them, and that is psychotherapy. Uh, so again, this is where the person with the disorder uh, interacts with a clinician, uh, so one that is credentialed or sanctioned or licensed in some way. Uh, it's not just a random person or even a friend or a family member. Uh, psychotherapy involves a trained specialist. Uh, so there are various schools of thought on psychotherapy, uh, but all of them require extensive training. Uh, and so this is uh, an approach that involves a specialist. Uh, and the goal of psychotherapy, of course, is to get relief from the problem. Uh, so to eliminate the disorder. Or, if eliminating the disorder is not possible, uh, at least to receive support for the problem uh, so that the symptoms aren't as severe or that it doesn't take quite so big a toll uh, on the patient's life. Uh, so th that, is, that is broadly speaking what psychotherapy is about. Uh, so the first one we'll talk about uh, is psychoanalytic therapy. Uh, and this falls under the category of psychodynamic therapy. Uh, I'm not going to belabor that distinction. Uh, there are, 
other therapies that your book mentions briefly that fall under psychodynamic, uh, I'm not going to worry about them. So psychoanalytic therapy uh, is worth noting uh, because it is really the first form of therapy. It goes all the way back to Sigmund Freud. And of course, for Sigmund Freud, we need to go all the way back to our unit on personality, uh, where we talk about Freud's ideas for the structure of the mind. So we have things like the id, the ego, and the superego. Uh, and of course, for Freud, uh, a lot of personality, in fact, most, most of personality uh, is set in childhood, even early childhood, before you have any memories. Uh, and so, similarly, in the psychoanalytic approach, uh, childhood experiences are very important. The point uh, of the psychoanalytic approach is, is to reveal those childhood experiences, those childhood memories, uh, and, and understand how they've come to affect the person's behavior, uh, why they've given rise to, to a psychological problem. Uh, and, of course, when it comes to the psychoanalytic approach, a big topic uh, is repression, uh, which is one of the defense mechanisms. I mentioned a few back in our unit on personality. Uh, repression is a big one when it comes to psychoanalytic therapy. Uh, the idea here is that a psychological disorder occurs uh, often because the, the person has suffered some trauma as a child, but because that traumatic memory uh, represents a threat to the ego, uh, that memory gets repressed. The person is not aware of the memory, they don't acknowledge the memory, uh, and so the point of psychoanalytic therapy is to access those repressed memories. And then once those are revealed, uh, the idea is to understand why those events, why those traumatic events, uh, have caused the psychological disorder. Uh, and so there are a number of techniques involved in psychoanalysis, uh, and they really rely on interpretation. So here the therapist's role uh, is to, again, get the individual to recall those repressed memories, uh, but that's not always, that direct approach is not always possible. Uh, a lot of what psychoanalysis is about uh, is about interpreting the responses of the patient. Uh, and, and trying to get insight into the patient's unconscious uh, by virtue of what it is they do in terms of behavior. This requires a lot of interpretation. Uh, so one technique is free association. Uh, here the therapist will ask the person just to sort of say whatever they're thinking, stream of thought, stream of consciousness. Uh, and so the person just jumps from topic to topic, says whatever they're thinking about. Uh, and, and again, the point here is to try and get insight into the unconscious. To the patient, they, don't, they may not have much self-insight as to what their responses reveal. Uh, but to the therapist, uh, the trained psychoanalyst, the idea is uh, that that person can interpret the stream of thoughts and gain insight into the person's unconscious. Uh, dream analysis is also a big part of psychoanalysis. Uh, for Sigmund Freud, uh, dreams were a window into the unconscious. This is when the unconscious mind could uh, express desires, for example, uh, unfulfilled wishes. Uh, and so by talking about dreams, Freud thought uh, you could gain insight into the person's unconscious. What was driving them? What was causing their behavior? And there's also the phenomenon of, of resistance. Uh, and in psychoanalysis, uh, resistance occurs uh, when the patient uh, puts up barriers to certain questions or certain lines of thought. So the therapist might suggest uh, a certain possibility in terms of the cause of a psychological disorder. Uh, and the patient might immediately dismiss that or uh, find that idea disturbing and not want to talk about it. Uh, so that unwillingness to acknowledge the idea uh, for the psychoanalyst uh, is a sign that you're on the right track. So that's called resistance, and so it's up to the analyst uh, to interpret that resistive behavior uh, and to see what that resistance says about the underlying cause of the disorder. Uh, and, and when it comes to psychoanalysis, uh, this is the classic image uh, of the therapist sitting in a chair behind the patient while the patient lies on the couch uh, and does most of the talking. Uh, so that, that is 
many people's conception of what psychotherapy is, but really that's just representative of the psychoanalytic approach in, in particular. Uh, and so part of this therapeutic approach uh, is the idea of transference. Uh, and this is where, after repeated interactions, uh, the therapist takes on a really important role in the patient's life. The patient becomes emotionally attached to the therapist uh, and starts to and, and, and transfer uh, unconscious fantasies or, or desires to the therapist. May start to treat the therapist uh, as they would a romantic partner or as they would a parent figure. Uh, and so in psychoanalysis, that's a very important component of therapy. So how common is this method? Uh, well, again, in the beginning, it was the first and only approach to therapy. Uh, now, it, it is not nearly so common. Only about 5% uh, of therapists use a pure psychoanalytic approach. Uh, so it's not as common anymore, uh, but it's historically important, so I've mentioned it here. And there's been a lot of criticism directed uh, at psychoanalysis. Uh, so, for example, the, the reliance on interpretation, uh, the idea is that those interpretations might say as much about the therapist as they really do about the patient. Uh, another problem that's often raised with psychoanalysis uh, is that it's not falsifiable, and this is true of, of Freud's theories in general. Uh, so, for example, there are so many defense mechanisms uh, that when a therapist proposes a memory or proposes a cause for behavior, that no matter what the patient says, the therapist is able to fit that into their existing notion uh, because you can describe any behavior, really, uh, as one form of defense mechanism or another. Uh, so, for example, if the therapist suggests that uh, the patient is too attached to their sister, uh, if they try to change the topic, well, that's resistance. Uh, if they say, no, you're, you're wrong, I love my sister, uh, that's another form of defense mechanism. Uh, if they say, oh, I, I really don't like my sister at all, well, then that's another defense mechanism also. Uh, and, and so no matter what the response is, uh, the psychoanalyst can say it is part uh, of the defense mechanism and is therefore a valid hypothesis. Uh, so that's another criticism. Uh, also, in terms of effectiveness, there's a lot of controversy uh, as to how effective uh, psychoanalytic therapy is. Uh, and and in, in particular, that idea of transference. Uh, there's been some evidence that transference actually can be a negative event. Uh, so these are all reasons that psychoanalysis is not as popular as it used to be. Uh, and again, psychoanalysis is just one form of psychodynamic therapy, but it's historically a very important one. Uh, and, and so your book goes into some detail there. Okay, so psychoanalysis was, again, the original version of therapy. Uh, but other versions of therapy, other approaches, have come along since then. Uh, and some of them have come along as a, as a response to psychoanalysis. Uh, and so the humanistic and existential schools of thought for therapy uh, were, at least in part, a reaction to the psychoanalytic therapeutic method. Uh, and so for humanistic therapy in particular, we have to go back to Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow, um, who we've mentioned before. So they were very important for the development of humanistic psychology in particular. Uh, and so here, if we think back to our unit on personality, uh, the emphasis is on a more positive view of human nature. Uh, in psychoanalysis, uh, the person's behavior is driven by repressed memories, by dark unconscious desires. Uh, and that's not a very happy view of, of how humans work. Uh, and so humanistic psychology and humanistic therapy uh, have a more positive view. Uh, and that is on personal growth. So in, in this conception, uh, psychological problems occur uh, because a person isn't reaching their potential or they're, they're somehow being blocked uh, from improving themselves. Uh, and so the emphasis here is on personal growth, on, on addressing how the person can still uh, self-actualize. Uh, and, and in existential therapy, uh, the idea there is, is that the person is, respond, is responding to 
uh, some form of existential isolation, loneliness, for example. Uh, and so the struggle is to find meaning in the person's life. Uh, but both of these are, are more positive views of human nature and, and very different approaches in terms of how they explain psychological disorders. And Rogers, in particular, uh, developed what is called person-centered therapy. And there are three big parts of person-centered therapy with regard to how the therapist is supposed to behave. Uh, so in psychoanalysis, uh, the session is very much led uh, by the therapist. They ask questions, they make suggestions in terms of what the behavior, what the person should do in terms of behavior or what's causing their behavior. Uh, in person-centered therapy, uh, the reason it's called person-centered uh, is that it focuses on the patient. So the therapist is really not leading the session. Uh, the therapist is not there to make judgments or even to make suggestions. Uh, so there are three things the therapist is supposed to do. Uh, one is exhibit empathy. So the therapist is supposed to feel what the patient feels. They're really supposed to understand how the patient feels and, and uh, put themselves in the situation of the patient. And this, again, is very different from psychoanalysis in which the therapist uh, is supposed to be very distant. Um, again, they're not even being viewed by the patient. They're sitting behind the patient. Uh, in person-centered therapy, uh, the therapist is much more visible and much more involved emotionally. The therapist is also supposed to create a non-judgmental environment. So no matter what the patient says or reveals, uh, the therapist is supposed to accept it uh, and not to judge it and not to suggest the person shouldn't behave that way. And this is called unconditional positive regard. Uh, so the idea not to be judgmental, not to give negative feedback about behavior or thoughts or feelings. And then finally, there's the idea of congruence. Uh, and what that means is uh, everything about what the therapist does should agree and should align with these first two principles. Uh, so the therapist shouldn't say that they approve of the behavior, but then exhibit a, a disgusted facial expression, uh, or they shouldn't use sarcasm, certainly. So that unconditional positive regard and empathy uh, should come through in everything the therapist does during the session. And that's what congruence is. And really the point here is to let the client or the patient uh, discover what it is they should do, to discover the source of their behavior. Uh, so a lot of what the therapist does in this form of therapy uh, is just rephrase or repeat back what the patient has already said. Uh, and so they, they act as kind of a knowledge store uh, in terms of giving back information that the patient has already said and may, and may have already forgotten or may not have thought it was important. Uh, and so the therapist is not really there to add anything new, is not there to give insight, is certainly not there to give suggestions as to behavior. Uh, they're really there to help the client figure out what it is that's causing their behavior and letting the client figure out what they should do about that behavior, how they should change. Uh, a related form of therapy uh, is what's called Gestalt therapy. That's a German word. And what Gestalt means is, is the whole. Take everything, not in terms of its component parts, uh, but looking at everything holistically. Uh, and so in this form of therapy, the emphasis is, is very much on how the patient feels in that moment. Uh, even if they're relating an experience that occurred in the past, uh, the Gestalt therapist will ask the patient how they feel as they describe a behavior or describe a past experience. Uh, and again, this differs from psychoanalysis uh, in that in psychoanalysis, the emphasis is very much on the past and feelings in the past. Uh, in Gestalt therapy, the idea is, is to look at how the person feels in that moment uh, and also uh, to try things out behaviorally. And one way that Gestalt therapists do this is through the empty chair technique. Uh, and this is a role-playing exercise where the patient, if the patient is having a problem, especially in a social relationship, they might act out how a, a conversation or how an interaction might go with someone else. 
uh, and so they will literally switch positions from one chair to the next, acting out both their own part and the part of the person they would interact with. Uh, and, and so it's a way of, of trying out different behaviors and trying to understand uh, why they're having the reactions they do. Now, when it comes to how common these techniques are, uh, these again are, are older techniques. So uh, humanistic and existential therapy had sort of its heyday in the 60s and 70s uh, and is not nearly as common now. Uh, it's about as common as psychoanalysis. So we're talking of around 5% of therapists using this technique in its pure form. Uh, as your book mentions, uh, some therapists will take an eclectic approach. They'll kind of pick and choose different methods depending on the patient. Uh, but pure humanistic and existential therapists and gestalt therapists uh, take up about 5%, 6% of, of therapists at large. Uh, another form of therapy is, is behavior therapy. Uh, and as you might guess from the name, uh, the focus here is, is on changing the person's behavior the outward symptom of a disorder, for example. Uh, and so in this sense, it's very much connected to behaviorism. Uh, if we remember back to our uh, unit on learning, uh, we talked about behaviorism. Uh, psychologists such as B.F. Skinner and John Watson. Uh, and, and so the idea there uh, is not to worry so much about the unconscious, which was so heavily emphasized in psychoanalysis. Uh, these other invisible mental processes repressed memories. Uh, but taking it even a step further, uh, behaviorism doesn't worry as much uh, about thoughts and feelings. Um, so the idea here is, is that maladaptive, that is unwanted behaviors, uh, are the result of learning. Uh, and so the job of the therapist here is to help the patient unlearn whatever it is that has caused them to exhibit this behavior. Uh, and so, again, the therapeutic method is very much focused on behavior, not so much sitting down and talking, for example, uh, as actions, uh, learning that certain actions are better than the maladaptive behaviors that the patient's been exhibiting so far. Uh, and so this is applicable, applicable in a number of domains. Uh, one is certainly with children. So we think back to operant conditioning. That is a form of learning. Uh, and if we recall, that form of learning uh, is, is where the organism, and here we'll talk about people, uh, where the person learns a connection between a behavior and an outcome. Uh, and so behaviorists uh, came up with this, this framework in which uh, a person behaves the way they do because they are either seeking out a reward or avoiding a punishment. Uh, and so in the case of children, uh, when a child misbehaves, uh, a behaviorist and a, a behavioral therapist uh, would say that the, the child is exhibiting that behavior uh, because they've learned that it's rewarding. And so maybe they'll get what they want if they throw a tantrum. Uh, or maybe they've learned that they can steal something and not be punished for it. So they can get what they want, and there are no negative effects. So they get a reward. Uh, and so here, especially with regard to children, uh, the idea is to use rewards and punishments so that the child unlearns those bad behaviors. Uh, and so this picture here from your book is a child sitting in time out, so a punishment for some bad behavior. And so that way, the child will eventually learn that that behavior is associated with the punishment and will stop exhibiting that behavior. Uh, but this isn't just important for children. Uh, people with psychological disorders can benefit from this approach also. Uh, in particular, when it comes to what is known as a token economy. So what does that mean? Uh, well, it means that any time the person exhibits a desired behavior or avoids exhibiting an undesired one, they get a token. They get a marker. Uh, and so they can, through repeated good behaviors, uh, they can acquire a, a collection of these markers, of these tokens. And then the idea is they can later trade these tokens in uh, for something they want. Uh, maybe it's an actual object, like a toy in the case of a child, or maybe it's an activity. Uh, they get to watch some television, or they get to do something else that they enjoy. Uh, and this has been shown to work, uh, certainly for children, 
Uh, also for children with autism spectrum disorders, token economy is going to be very helpful. Uh, but even in adults, uh, so people that are recovering from drug abuse, uh, token economies work well uh, to keep the person from relapsing, to keep them from using drugs. And so if they test negative for a drug of abuse, they get a token. After a, a certain number of days and tokens acquired, uh, they get something they want. It's also been shown to work for schizophrenia, uh, which is surprising but also encouraging. Uh, so individuals with schizophrenia will develop patterns of behavior that are more desirable. Uh, they won't exhibit those maladaptive behaviors uh, if they're set in a token economy. So they can acquire tokens, uh, even in an institutional setting. They can acquire tokens for things that they want and then trade them in later. And so this gives an incentive for good behavior, and it shows the effects of learning. Uh, another way that learning is used in behavior therapy uh, is through exposure therapy. Uh, and, and here, uh, this, this deals in particular uh, with obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, but also with phobic disorders. So if, a certain, if someone has a, a, a excessive and irrational fear of something, either an object or a situation, uh, exposing them to that object or situation over and over again uh, can be a way of alleviating that phobia. Uh, and this goes back to the idea of extinction. So this lower left diagram is from, uh, is from your book, from the chapter on learning. Uh, and if we think back to classical conditioning, that's a form of learning in, in which the individual learns to associate a stimulus with an outcome and therefore exhibits a response. Uh, and so what extinction is, if we think back to that unit on learning, uh, is unlearning. So what I've indicated here with this blue box uh, is that first you acquire that association. Uh, for Pavlov's dog, uh, the dog learned to associate a bell with food. Uh, and so when those two things occurred together, the dog learned to expect food when the bell rang. Uh, but in the case of phobias, the idea is the person expects something bad to happen when that stimulus shows up. So if it's a dog, for example, they, they must have learned, under the behaviorist framework, uh, that the dog will hurt them, or they expect the dog to hurt them. Uh, and so this is something they've learned. It is a belief they have. It's an association they have. Uh, and so with exposure therapy, uh, the idea is to give them the stimulus, the dog in this case, uh, but not the harm. So they unlearn that association after being exposed over and over again. So they learn that the stimulus isn't associated with whatever consequence they thought it was. And so they unlearn the phobia uh, by being exposed to it over and over again and learning that the stimulus isn't associated with whatever negative event they expected. So that's what I'm highlighting here in, in this figure from your book on the learning chapter. Uh, eventually, the organism, the, pe the person in this case, uh, will unlearn that association. And that can be used for all sorts of phobias. Uh, certainly things like spiders or dogs, heights. Uh, as long as the person doesn't come to harm when they're with the stimulus, uh, they can unlearn those negative consequences they've come to expect. Uh, a related technique is exposure and response prevention. And in particular, this deals with Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, or OCD. Uh, and so what this is, uh, is, is exposing the person to the stimulus, but with an important addition. Uh, and that is that individuals with OCD uh, will often have behaviors uh, that they exhibit compulsively, uh, especially after exposure to a stimulus. So this picture from your book uh, shows a public restroom. Uh, and so if the person's uh, OCD symptoms revolve around germs, uh, just being around the stimulus might make them compulsively wash their hands or bathe themselves over and over again. The idea with exposure and response prevention uh, it is not just to expose them to the stimulus, but to prevent them from making those responses. So the person might have to go into a public restroom, but they don't get to wash their hands afterwards. Uh, or they might touch something else they might think is, is uh, associated with the disease, but they don't get to clean up afterwards. 
Uh, and so the idea, again, here is to deal with not just the anxiety of the stimulus, but also to alleviate uh, those behaviors that occur as a result. So by exposing the person to stimulus, but preventing them from giving in to those behavioral compulsions, uh, the idea is they, again, unlearn that association. So they learn that they don't need to exhibit those behaviors to cope with the stimulus. But they can cope with the stimulus just fine without those behaviors. Uh, another form of therapy uh, is cognitive therapy. Uh, and this is a more common one. Uh, so here, uh, there, there is a learning component, uh, but the learning uh, is not as much about behavior. Uh, here, it, it's about learning beliefs, learning more accurate beliefs, uh, or what your book refers to as distorted thinking. So a person might have uh, a set of beliefs about their own behavior, about their own mental state, uh, about their own abilities, uh, and especially with regard to negative beliefs, they may, may not be accurate. They may not be based on real experience or may not at least be based on most experience. The person could have effectively selected one experience and, and based a whole belief system off of that. Uh, and so to alleviate that phenomenon, uh, the therapist will use cognitive restructuring. Uh, and this is where the therapist uh, questions those negative or unrealistic beliefs. So if the person thinks that no one likes them, uh, the therapist might start a line of questions that, that causes the person to question that belief. So it might say, well, you know, do you, do you have any friends? And the person might say, yes. And do you have any family? Yes. Do you spend time with them? The person says, yes. And do they seem to enjoy that time? Uh, and, and so this, this line of questioning and answering by the, by the patient demonstrate that their prior belief isn't really valid. Uh, again, they might have come up with it on their own, or they might have come up with it on the basis of a single experience. Maybe someone seemed not to like them, but now they think no one likes them. Uh, and so that, that exaggerated component is unrealistic. And so the, the therapist's job uh, is to ask questions uh, and get the patient to acknowledge the information they already have uh, that, that denies those beliefs, that causes the, the, the person to question them. Uh, and so this is really evidence-based thinking. Uh, and so again, the therapist uh, will not speak in, in general, will actually appeal to the person's own experience uh, and show them that those beliefs aren't, aren't really based in fact. Uh, and so your book has a, has a transcript uh, of one of these interactions. Uh, about how the person, the patient, comes to realize that all these negative perceptions they have about themselves uh, aren't accurate uh, and and aren't supported by the by the behavior of the people around them. Uh, another approach to cognitive therapy is through mindfulness meditation, and so this is a medita meditation technique uh, that doesn't really depend on any particular spiritual practice. Uh, but instead just promotes awareness uh, of the person's own thoughts and feelings. Uh, and in this way, they can, again, really examine their own experience. Uh, and if they start to have negative feelings or beliefs, uh, they can have some insight as to what's causing them. And they can tell why they might be feeling that way. Uh, and, and more recently, cognitive and behavior therapies have sort of been combined into what's often referred to as cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, or CBT. Uh, and, and so CBT is more problem-focused, and what do I mean by that? It, it's geared to addressing a particular disorder. So the focus is on the problem itself, the disorder or the symptoms the person is suffering from. Uh, and so whether a more cognitive approach or a more behavioral approach is appropriate, uh, is up to the therapist. Uh, and again, it's based on what the problem is. Uh, and one of the important points in, in cognitive or uh, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, is that this is a transparent approach. Uh, and what that means is it, it's different from psychoanalysis uh, in that the therapist is very upfront about what 
the technique is about, about what the technique is trying to, to do in terms of behavioral change. Uh, and so the therapist isn't hiding anything. Uh, they are very clear on what the technique involves, what it's going to bring about, uh, how the person might feel or think afterwards. Uh, and again, that's in contrast to psychoanalysis, uh, in which the therapist is very much uh, hiding, to, and to some extent, what it is they're trying to do. So they're trying to get at repressed memories. And so to do that requires a certain amount of deception. Uh, and, and so the therapist doesn't want to, if they're a psychoanalyst, doesn't want to reveal exactly what it is they're getting at. Uh, and so that's one big difference between psychoanalysis and some of these other approaches, but cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy in particular, is that transparency on the part of the therapist. So how common are these approaches? Uh, behavioral therapy in its pure form is not very common. It's about 3%. Cognitive therapy, much more common. Uh, and the combination of cognitive and behavioral, CBT, uh, is quite common as well. It's not labeled specifically on this diagram, uh, but it is one of the more uh, integrative approaches. And then finally, one approach to treatment is group treatment. Uh, so mental disorders and, and symptoms, psychological problems, uh, can often have a social basis. So the disorder could be caused by stress in the social environment, uh, but also other people can be helpful uh, in alleviating symptoms. Uh, in understanding the source of the disorder. Uh, and, and so working with other, other people, multiple people at once, uh, can also be very helpful. Uh, one form of group treatment is, is couples and family therapy. And so this is where uh, the individuals in the therapeutic setting uh, don't have a mental disorder, uh, but really that there's a problem with the interaction between family members or the interaction within a couple. Uh, if one of the members does have a mental disorder, well, then that's a good reason to use one-on-one -on -one therapy, use one of the approaches we've already talked about. Uh, but when a mental disorder is not involved, uh, couples or family therapy uh, can be a good approach. That way the therapist can see how the individuals interact, uh, can understand what the cause of the problem is, uh, when it doesn't really stem from one individual. Uh, it's really about the interaction of the two people or the multiple people in the family. Uh, and, and so that's why the therapist needs to witness that interaction. Seeing one individual by themselves won't provide much insight. Uh, there is also group therapy. Uh, and so this is where it's not a family, it's not a couple. These are strangers, or at least they start out being strangers. But they often have a common problem. So maybe they're suffering from the same psychological disorder. Uh, and, and here, there is a therapist, um, and, and so one of the pros of this technique uh, is there's someone to lead the group. There's someone who understands the disorder, who's trained to treat the disorder. Uh, and again, it, it is a group setting, so it can be very efficient uh, if one therapist can treat everyone at once. Uh, also, people get some social support. They realize they're not alone in having this, this disorder. Uh, other people in the group may give them valuable insight as to the cause of the disorder or how to deal with the symptoms. And so other people can be uh, an important support network there. Uh, one of the downsides is that because it's a group, uh, the therapist doesn't have as much control over those interactions. Uh, so it doesn't have control over behaviors that each group member exhibits. Uh, and so one group member uh, may say something that upsets another group member uh, or may make the problem worse, may suggest uh, a behavior or, or a, a way of alleviating symptoms that doesn't work or isn't harmful. Uh, and so there's not as much control over the information that patients get. So that's one of the big downsides. Uh, another form of therapy is self-help or support groups. And so here we're still talking about a group of unrelated individuals uh, that are often united by a common problem. Um, and examples here are Alcoholics Anonymous or Gamblers Anonymous. Uh, and, and here, there is no psychotherapist. There's no one leading the group. Uh, and so you have some of the same downsides uh, as you do for group therapy, less control. Uh, an, an additional downside uh, is that there's no one checking up on the group. There's no one 
who, who can say whether a behavior or a technique is a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, so there's even less control of the group in that sense. Um, it has some of the same pros. People see that other people have the same problem. Uh, they learn ways to deal with the problem. Uh, but again, it's a little decentralized. There's no, uh, there's no psychotherapist leading the interaction. Uh, and, and so, again, these are individuals that are unrelated, uh, that often have a, a common problem, and, and talk it out. And, and it can be difficult to assess effectiveness, especially in these self-help and support group settings. Um, oftentimes, these interactions can be structured. So AA has a 12-step program. Uh, and part of these names is the word anonymous. Uh, so it can be very hard to follow up or to measure how much uh, people benefit from this approach. Um, it's hard to get data on this approach. Also, because you're talking about a complex social group and a complex program, uh, it can be difficult to tell which parts of the program are helpful and which may be harmful. Uh, and, and so the anonymity uh, and the complexity uh, of the group can make it really hard to tell how good a job this therapeutic approach does. Uh, but there is evidence that it, that it can be helpful uh, in many contexts. Okay, that will do it for our unit on psychotherapy. Uh, next time we're going to look at more biological approaches to treating mental disorders. Uh, so we'll look at medication. That is, a, that is an obvious one. Uh, psychotherapeutic drugs are a big part uh, of, of many therapists' uh, approach. Uh, but not all biological approaches uh, involve medication. There are also surgical approaches. Uh, so we'll talk about some of those as well. Uh, and then we'll wrap up the lecture uh, talking about effectiveness. So how good is psychotherapy or how good is a biological treatment at alleviating certain disorders? And the short answer is it depends on the disorder. Sometimes one is good, sometimes the other is good, sometimes a combination works. Uh, so we'll talk about that next, next time as well. Uh, and next lecture will be the last lecture in our course. Uh, so the last little part of the lecture, uh, I'll review what the point of the course was, what you hopefully learned. Uh, and, and so I'll do that uh, next lecture as well, and I will see you then.